This deadly trio of pathogen is responsible for more than 40% of falls death, and the mere mention of these disease will strike fear in the heart of breeders and veterinarian and the likes. You see they're invisible. They're expensive to treat, and they attack foals in three different yet devastating ways. One will infiltrate the body's defense and hide to reproduce. The other will dissolve everything in its path to get the material it needs to survive, while the other one will strategically target the most useful cell for its own needs. So what are they? Why are they so dangerous? What are the early clinical signs that you should be watching for? And finally, what can breeders do to protect their foals? Understanding their mechanism will help you appreciate what vets and vet tech teams can do in order to help these foals survive these infections. The first pathogen is a virus. Like all virus, it's unable to reproduce without the use of a host cell. Viruses simply lack the system to make copies of themselves. The virus in question here is the equine rotavirus, and the cells it's targeting are the ones at the tip of the villi's in the intestine lining of foals, generally those under three months of age. Villi's are those finger-like projections found on the inside of the intestine that increases the surface where nutrient can be absorbed into the bloodstream. The destruction of these highly specialized cells lead to a complete disruption of the osmosis balance in the intestine, causing severe diarrhea, leading to dehydration, and that weakens the foal even further. And all this can happen in just a few hours. The virus is found in manure, and just a speck of it contains enough viral particle to cause the illness. Unfortunately, because adult horse can carry it and be completely asymptomatic, showing no signs of trouble, it can already be in the environment and you just don't know until you have a foal starting to go downhill very quickly. From ingesting the contaminated material to the start of symptoms it can be as quick as 12 to 24 hours. You see, as soon as the virus, who manages to escape the stomach environment, reaches the mid and lower part of the small intestine, it finds the cell it has evolved to be able to penetrate. It invades them, takes them over. Then they replicate in the cell and there's no more room and then they burst out and they release millions of virus into the intestine that gets eliminated by the feces and out in the environment with manure. What if virus is found in humans too? It's one that causes what we call the stomach flu, right? The one that gives you a runny diarrhea, cuts your appetite, and puts you down for days. So why is it so deadly in foals? Well, you see, once a foal starts to feel sick, they generally stop drinking. In fact, that's your first sign that something is up. Young foals drink constantly, just a little bit at a time, not like calves. That's because foal's stomach is a fraction of the size of that of a calf of the same size. So they drink a few times every hour. So if you see a foal that is not nursing very much, that's very telling. And if you can, if you look at the mare's udder and it starts to be engorged with milk, that is definitely a red flag. Also, in the case of equine rotavirus, and I don't know if that's the case with human rotavirus because I didn't look that one up, but the destruction of the tip of the villi means that the lactase, the enzyme that allows for the digestion of milk, is no longer produced. So now we have undigested milk, an unbalanced environment in the gut caused by all this inflammation, and the destruction of the villies. Well, that causes massive liquid diarrhea. This is not just loose stool here. We're talking squirting out massive quantities. Foals generally will not show an increase in temperature at that point. So if you see a foal that is not nursing very well, that has profuse liquid diarrhea, don't wait for it to have a temperature to think that maybe something's up. No. If you see all that and the foal is under three months of age, that's your cue to put it on trailer with its mother and head to the closest clinic. From now on, the foal will need to be monitored closely. Because this is caused by a virus, there is no antibiotics that can resolve the issue very quickly. The treatment is supportive. Supportive care until the foal's body's defense come into action, overwhelm and remove the offender, and then the gut is allowed to heal. So once at the clinic, the vet or the vet techs will be able to put the foal on IV fluid and monitor its overall metabolism. Once the foals start to bounce back from the dehydration, they might still prevent it from nursing because if you remember, the milk it takes in won't be digested, so it becomes more of an irritant. In that case, they might put in some IV nutrition until the gut is rested and starts to recover. Now that we know what it is and what the symptoms are, you're probably wondering then what can be done to prevent it. Well, Ideally, if you can do anything to prevent the foal from ingesting manure, especially in the first few hours and days of its life, then do that, because that's when it's at its most fragile. Cleaning the style, disinfecting it completely using Vercon or Tectrol, they're very effective against the rotavirus. 
bleach, by the way, is completely useless. Uh, keeping the mare as clean as possible, especially where the foal might lick or nuzzle her. Maybe even bathing her prior to giving birth, especially her legs, the belly, her udder, and under the tail. All that is very useful. The foal eventually will eat its dam's manure when it's a couple of, you know, a couple of days to a week old. And that's completely normal behavior. But at this point, you should watch your foal carefully because if the mare happens to be shedding that virus in her manure, the foal will start to show sign of trouble within 24 hours. A vaccine for rhodococcus was developed in the 1970s, and it needs to be given at 8, 9, and 10 months of gestation. But it has limited efficacy, to be perfectly honest. This virus, like all virus, evolves rather quickly, and a vaccine developed for a strain that was identified 50 years ago is just not that useful. But Having said that, like all vaccine, the typical disclaimer is that even if it doesn't prevent the disease, it might reduce the severity of it. The reality is that because billions of virus are shed in the manure of a sick foal, and that those viruses can stay alive in the environment for months, it's very hard not to have contamination of the soil. And what that means is that if you had a foal with the world of virus on your farm, you're likely to have another. So, other than having your mare foal elsewhere, early intervention and supportive care is the best way to save the foal. The next pathogen also causes massive diarrhea, but attacks in a different way than the world of virus. It's part of a family of bacteria that causes damage by releasing toxin that literally dissolves cells so that they can harvest the content to consume. It's a little bit like when thieves would ram a truck into a store just to loot its content. If you have a horse, you are already familiar with another member of that gang, tetanus. And if you either follow celebrities or you have a passion for wild birds, you know the other one, botulism. For you bird lovers, the botulism toxin is what is in Botox, the injection for those wanting to stay forever young. And for those of you pop culture people, botulism outbreak can sometimes kill thousands of wild birds in just one go. Clostridium, specifically now we're talking about Clostridium perfringent, is the next killer I want to talk about. It has a lot of similarities with the rotavirus. In the fact that it's also found in feces and therefore in the soil, it can also live in adult horse with no major effect. In fact, we don't quite know why it suddenly takes over the gut. Also, it enters via the mouth and targets the intestine. But this one is worse because the damage is caused by a toxin, something that not only destroys the cell lining of the intestines, but causes massive inflammation. And it can also lead to the bacteria entering the bloodstream. And at that point, it can cause widespread damage to other parts of the body. What does it look like then? Well, the clinical sign will be very similar to the rotavirus ones, but they'll be often accompanied with signs of colic. You see, the toxin, the toxin, you see, the toxin attacking the lining of the intestine can be quite painful. So watch for the same signs. Diarrhea, not eating, an uncomfortable fall, generally unwell, and going downhill fast. But how do you know if you're dealing with a rotavirus or a clostridium? Well, it doesn't matter at this point. Your foal needs to get to a clinic and you need to let the vet and the vet tech determine what is going on. They will test the feces, they will pull blood, they will use various lab tests to determine which one is affecting your foal and therefore which protocol to use to treat it. Because you see, the intervention needed to save a foal with clostridium is a lot more involved than just supportive care like it was with rotavirus. The vet team will use a combination of intervention to limit the damage of the toxin, support the foal, they will give the foal some antibiotics, and work to maintain the function of the intestine. Why antibiotics? Well, remember, we're dealing here with a bacteria, so it is susceptible to some antibiotics. They will also work to keep the foal nourished and hydrated through IV. They will limit the diarrhea in any way they can, and they will generally look to maintain the overall physiological health of the foal. The treatment is quite involved and therefore quite expensive. And sadly, it is sometimes futile because if the damage to the intestine is too great or the infection has spread to other part of the body, it can lead to general septicemia and death. Just like in the case of the rotavirus, the sooner you can get the fall to the clinic, the higher the chance of bringing it back home. Now, having said all that, 
it brings us back to the question of how can we prevent foals from getting ill in the first place? Because the foals ingest Clostridium bacteria the same way they ingest the equine rotavirus mentioned earlier, the same precaution applies. Disinfect the foaling environment, keep it clean, keep the mare clean as possible, and monitor the foal closely for the clinical sign that something is a bit off. What about a vaccine? Well, there are five variants of Clostridium perfringent, cleverly called A, B, C, D, and E. And uh, they each make their own specialized toxin. Horses generally have A or C. There is no vaccine that targets the A variant. The B and the C are found in cattle, and there is a toxoid available against those strains. They trigger an immunity against the specific toxin they produce but it's off-label use for horses. Still, your vet might want to prescribe it to your mare if, it, if you're planning on foaling her in a high-risk environment. And in that case, it needs to be given six weeks and three weeks prior to birth. Now, when we know how hard it is to predict the birth in itself, that can be a bit of a challenge. If you don't know the foaling sign, I have a video on this right there in the card. But how do you know if you're foaling in a high-risk environment? Sadly, it's a little bit hard to tell unless there's already been case a case on the farm where you are. But if you are foaling your mare on a ground that had cows before, there is a higher risk that the soil is contaminated because bacterial spores are spread in feces, in the manure, and they can, they're very resistant. They can last a long time in that environment. So even if there hasn't been any cows in this environment for many years, you might still have a problem. In that case, vaccinating your mare and putting the foal on them antibiotics as soon as it's born, specifically metronidazole, for the first week of its life as a um, proactive right, prophylactically. Also, administering some Clostridium antitoxin to the foal hours after birth has shown to reduce the chances of foals falling out from it. Finally, this brings us to the last of the three dreaded foal disease. The silent one, the one you don't see coming until it's almost too late, and the number one cause of pneumonia in foals under the age of six months. It won't make the foal sick right away, unlike, unlike the other two we just saw. And when the first symptoms appear, they will be subtle and they can easily be missed unlike the explosive watery diarrhea of the first two. In some folds, for reason we don't entirely understand, once the symptoms appear, it will probably be too late. While for others, they might have minimum symptoms and the disease appear to be self-limiting. Researchers don't quite know why there is such a variation, but they suspect that the genetic makeup of the individual foals have an impact on how resistant or how susceptible they are. Like the other pathogen we saw, it lies in the soil, and in this case it gets inhaled in the lungs of the foal. What am I talking about? I'm talking about tuberculosis, kid brother, Rhodococcus equi. Rhodococcus is a bacteria type. It lives in the soil and it's found everywhere. And for the most part, it only targets weak immune system. To be clear, it's a disease of foals. It rarely causes any problem for animals over the age of six months. And the infection occurs usually in the first few days, few weeks of life, when foals' immune system is still just developing. Just like tuberculosis that it resembles so much, the infection progresses slowly. By the way, if you want to know more about tuberculosis, one of the oldest and deadliest disease for humans, I recommend John Green's Everything is Tuberculosis. Rhodococcus is particularly sneaky because it hijacks part of the immune system for its own use. You see, normally when a foreign body is detected, the white cells are mobilized. These are the, um, the wally of the immune cells, right? They track down the offending pathogen, they engulf it in their membrane, and then they dissolve it. The problem is that rhodococcus takes over the white cell once it's been consumed. It resists the destruction. And then it finds itself perfectly safe from further attack from the immune system because it's inside the white cell itself. It is in peace to hide and reproduce. Over time, these zombie white cells create abscess and pustules. They're mostly found in the lungs. That's where the infections start, usually right on the pleural surface, meaning the top layer of the lungs. But the bacteria can migrate to other part of the body and create abscesses around the lymph system or in the digestive tract, and it can also infiltrate into joints, causing joint sepsis. To be clear, those abscesses are on the inside, and most of the time, you can't see them. So what should you be watching for? Well, that's where it's a little bit difficult, because often there's not a lot of signs. Sometimes the only thing you can observe is a dry cough. Just, just a little cough, here and there. 
Nothing serious, nothing coming out of the nose, and certainly no sign of temperature, and the foal usually acts perfectly normal. But then the cough gets more consistent and more persistent, and then it starts to get moist and phlegmy. And yes, that's how the virus spreads, actually. The foal will produce some phlegm, and eventually the foal will swallow that phlegm, and that phlegm is absolutely chock full of rhodococcus bacteria, and it gets released in the stool and in the environment. The only true diagnostic is from culturing that phlegm and doing a PCR on it to get its genetic signature. But that takes a long time. It's a lot quicker to perform an ultrasound of the lungs right there, right on the farm. All is needed is an ultrasound machine and some alcohol to get really good contact between the probe and the skin. Foals don't have a lot of fat or muscle, so it's relatively easy to image the surface of the lungs. Now, any roughness, sometimes referred to as comet trails, at the pleural contact of the lungs is suspicious, but it can be seen in any kind of pneumonia. You can see an image here of what it looks like. But it's when you find abscesses, like this one, that's the telltale sign of the rhodococcus pneumonia. When the disease has reached a point where the abscesses are larger than 3-4 to four centimeter, the disease will likely not resolve on its own and can be fatal in 80% of the cases. That is if it's left untreated. If it's treated, these days treatment gives you 60 to set to sorry, 60 to 90% chance of survival. The treatment is problematic, however. The antibiotics that are effective at killing rhodococcus in vivo, erythromycin, clarithromycin, and others in that family, have difficulty penetrating abscess and attacking the bacteria. So they need to be combined with another drug, rifampin, that is able to penetrate the abscess and the membrane of the white cells that is hiding the rhodococcus bacteria. Because the bacteria is slow at everything it does, it's also slow at taking in the antibiotic. So the treatment is long, generally given orally, twice a day for 6 to 12 weeks. Also, another problem. While foals tolerate the medication relatively well, adult horse often develop enterocolitis if they ingest it. So there is always a risk to the dam of the foal being treated to get this very dangerous condition. One has to be particularly careful not to expose the dam to any of that medication. Another issue with those particular antibiotics, they work on rhodococcus, but they affect, they impact the ability of the foal to regulate its own temperature. That means that if it's in the sun for too long, or if it lives in a hot climate, they can overheat, and they can die in a matter of hours from that. So now that you know all this, and you're probably wondering, okay, well, is this one that can be prevented? Here again, the trouble is that there is no vaccine. Immunologically, it's a very complex disease to address, and it's been frustrating veterinarian doing vaccine research on it for decades. The only protection that you can offer your foal, therefore, is to give it a transfusion of plasma from a donor horse. A donor horse that has developed the antibodies against rhodococcus, because you see, adult horse can get it, and they mount the appropriate immune response without developing the disease. So the preferred protocol is to give that foal that special leader of plasma in the first day or so, and then another one 25 days later. There's a newer protocol that's proposed with two liter given at birth, and it has actually pretty good success. Remember that foals are most likely to be infected in the first day, the first week. So getting that plasma in the foal to support its immune system with the right antibodies as soon as possible is usually the way breeders choose to fight back against rhodococcus. However, it's not a guarantee. Many foals that receive the plasma still develop the disease. Like I said, it's a complex one. But of course, the biggest concern with all three of these potentially deadly disease is that you don't know you have that pathogen on your farm until a foal gets sick. And once a foal has gotten sick, then you can be almost guaranteed that there is this is something you will need to deal with more than once. So that's why it's so important to know what is normal and what is not normal in young foals. And if you want to know more about that, please watch this video right here, and I will see you on the next one.